Hello there. My name is Laura Ellen McKinney and I am a storyteller. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Limbo Land. Zora Neale Hurston, a weaver of beautiful tales, said that there is no agony like bearing an untold story inside you. Now, I am not so big on agony, so rather than suffer by holding it inside me, I'm going to share it. I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to tell you a story. So what will today's story be? You'll see. But it may well start as so many good stories do, with four words that you know, so you can repeat them with me. Are you settled in? Are you ready for our story? Because we're ready to start. Let's say those four magic words. Once upon a time. As a companion piece to the Frederick Douglass speech, which I read and which is available on Patreon and YouTube, I thought I would provide for some of you who do not know some biographical information about Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was an African-American social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer, and statesman. After escaping from slavery in Maryland, he became a national leader of the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York, becoming famous for his oratory and his incisive and insightful anti-slavery writings. He was born in February 1818. It's not entirely certain. He did not even really know. He was born in Talbot County, Maryland. His mother was an enslaved black woman. His father was white and of European descent. He was actually born Frederick Bailey. That was his mother's name. And he took the name Douglas, this interesting spelling with the two S's, only after he escaped from slavery. His full name at birth was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Quite a name. Now, some of the history sites will say something to the nature of, after he was separated from his mother as an infant. Separated from his mother as an infant. He was stolen from his mother, an enslaved woman, and put into slavery elsewhere. Now he did manage to live for a time with his maternal grandmother, Betty Bailey. However, at the age of six, he was moved away from her to live and work at the Y Plantation in Maryland. Formerly it was called the Y House Plantation. From there he was given, sold, to Lucretia Ald, whose husband Thomas sent him to work with his brother Hugh in Baltimore. Douglas credits Hugh's wife Sophia with first teaching him the alphabet. This is a big deal. It was illegal to teach slaves to read. Why? Because knowledge is the key to freedom. It opens up new worlds to you. It allows you to imagine. And if you are held in bondage, it will help you imagine what freedom might be like. So you don't teach slaves to read. They're probably too stupid anyway, of course. Right? That's the thinking. That's the convenient thinking. But he was taught and he was he actually taught himself to read and write. He learned the alphabet from his mistress, taught himself to read and write. And by the time he was hired out to work under a man named William Friedland, he was teaching other enslaved people to read using the Bible. Now, what's important here, even though he wasn't a minister, is that black men, primarily men, but black ministers are ranked about the highest position in African-American culture. The reason for that is that a lot of them were like Frederick. They were taught illegally to read. They were taught using the Bible and sometimes with elementary primers. But because they knew the Bible and could then share the stories of enslaved Israelites, right, whom God set free, they became an 
a New Testament faith as Christians, but held on to the Old Testament story of freedom for God's people, right? So it was important that he did this. He also made a note, Frederick Douglass did, that the figure of William Friedland stood in direct contrast to the rest of the slave owners in his life story. His previous masters have all shared one or two traits, hypocritical piety. They were men of God who beat the crap out of slaves, who owned them to begin with, or inconsistent brutality. Cruelty was the purpose, right? Douglas presents Friedland as a good slave owner because he wasn't hypocritically pious and he wasn't inconsistently brutal. It's a low bar. It's the only bar he had. Now, as word spread of Frederick Douglass's efforts to educate fellow enslaved people, actually Frederick Bailey's efforts to educate and uh, fellow enslaved people, Thomas Auld, his owner, transferred him to Edward Covey. So he transferred ownership. Edward Covey was a farmer who was known for his brutal treatment of enslaved people. He was one of the bad ones. Now, there are marriages in this story that are interesting. They're interesting because while I'm going to present you two separate and legal marriages, one happening and then another happening upon the death of the first wife, the fact of the matter was that Frederick Douglass lived with his black first wife and the white woman who later became his wife at the same time for some period of time, a lengthy period of time, they shared a home. It was some sort of, I don't know if we could call it polyamorous because I do not know whether or not it was something that the first wife, the black wife wanted or simply felt that she had to endure because she had this amazing man. And so we've got that story, but here are the wives. So Anna Murray Douglas was an American abolitionist, a member of the Underground Railroad, first wife of social reformer and statesman Frederick Douglass from 1838, so 20, almost 20 years before the end of slavery, to her death in 1882. The story of Frederick Douglass's hopes and aspirations and longing for freedom has been told. You all know it. It is a story made possible by the unswerving loyalty of Anna Murray. This is a quote from their daughter, one of five children that they had together, whose name was Rosetta Douglas Sprague. Now, when Anna met Frederick Bailey, she was working as an older teenager, a domestic in Baltimore. Baltimore was a vibrant community of about 17,000 free blacks who organized churches and schools in spite of the repressive laws that restricted their freedoms. This is a note to take for the current state of our country. Keep doing the work, keep helping the people, someday with God's grace, we'll all be free. Now, historians disagree on when and where the acquaintanceship between Anna and Frederick occurred, but it may have been attending the same church. She was financially prepared to start a life with him. She had some money saved from working as a domestic, basically now working for low wages in a job which she would have had as an enslaved person. But first, in order to start a life with him, he needed to be free. How do you do that? Right? go along the Underground Railroad. Well, that was going to be hard for them to do together. So by borrowing a Freedmen's Protection Certificate from a friend and wearing the disguise of a sailor sewn by Anna, he attempted to secure his freedom. A bit about these papers. These protection papers were used to define freemen and citizenship. So many black sailors and other men use them to show that they were freemen if they were stopped by officials or by slave catchers. Now, slave catchers are what became the police. They were called paddy rollers, patrollers, right? So the first 
police forces were slave catchers. These papers were also called free papers because they certified that the person holding them was a non-slave. It certified their non-slave status. So in his uniform and his sailor's uniform and with his free papers, Frederick made his way to New York City by train. He didn't have any money, so it's quite possible that he was spending Anna's money to buy the ticket. Once in New York City, Frederick sent for Anna, who came down from Baltimore, which is not very far away. And they were married in the home of abolitionist David Ruggles. According to their daughter, Rosetta, Anna brought nearly everything with her that the couple needed to begin their life together. A feather bed with pillows and linens. This is fancy stuff. Dishes with cutlery. Very nice stuff. And a full trunk of clothing for herself. It doesn't sound as if she brought any clothing for him. So I don't know where he got his clothes, but she brought those things to start their life together. And they had a long life together, at which some point Helen Pitts became a part. Helen Pitts Douglas was an American suffragist known for being the second wife of Frederick Douglass. She also created the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Association, which later became the Frederick Douglass National Historical Site. It's a place that I've been and spent a considerable amount of time. They were married from 1884, so two years after the death of Anna, from 1884 to 1895, though they had been together for a considerable amount of time before that. Many national publications at the time targeted the newlyweds age gap, mistakenly stating that Helen was younger than Frederick's eldest child. In reality, Helen and Frederick were 21 years apart in age, which is a big distance, that's a generation. There were criticisms from white people and from black people that targeted the interracial nature of their marriage. Now, the white people's complaint would be, she's marrying an animal, a non-human, no matter how famous he had gotten, his fame, his brilliance, any of the positive attributes attributed to him were that he was exceptional and not like the rest of the black folks. It's, it's a challenge that we still live with today. You're special. Maybe other people are special too. Everybody has a gift, right? So that may be what white people said, what black people would have been saying, which is something that they still say, is you are the most important black man in the country. Give the benefits of those credentials to another black woman. Now, he might have been saying, I love who I love. He also was biracial. He didn't have a relationship with his father that we know of, but this was part of him. So he was falling in love with a woman who was like him in some ways. He had done it on both sides, right? He had a black wife and a white wife for his black and white self. I don't know. But there were criticisms from everyone about the interracial nature of their marriage. It wasn't entirely legal. It wasn't really legal at all, but he managed it. Now, in his will, he bequeathed Cedar Hill, the place where he lived, across the Anacostia River in Washington, D.C., to Helen. But his will lacked the number of witnesses that were necessary for bequests of real estate. So as a consequence, it was ruled invalid. Helen suggested to his children and to their spouses that they agree to set Cedar Hill apart as a memorial to their father and deed it to a board of trustees. The children declined, insisting that the estate be sold and the money divided amongst the heirs. Now, why would they do that? Certainly they wanted to honor their father. I don't know why they did this, except to say that unfair taxes would likely have caused them to lose it or outright theft. The state of Mississippi owes my family a turpentine plantation that they took from my great grandfather, who was not a black man, he was a brown man but they, those things were the same to them. All of the men in this region were asked to go into a, a government office and present the papers that outlined the 
the property. They gave the properties proper uh, dimensions and limits, all of their tax papers, those kinds of things, because there were going to be some new taxes that were going to be applied to their land. Then the courthouse burned down conveniently and they were never able to then reclaim their land, which was sold to railroads and given to white people, including poor white people, some of whom my great grandfather had previously employed. So this kind of thing would likely have happened to them. It was the same period of time. So they might have just wanted the money because the money could be something that they held in their hands. Now, what happened was that while they wanted it to be sold, and it appears that it might have been Helen bought it. She bought the property. It's much, it was much easier for women to buy land, even though women did not easily purchase land, no matter their race. The battle for female property rights has been engaged from the 1700s to now. It is harder for women to buy property, even now. And it may again change because now women are not people with full agency over our bodies and minds, and so we cannot possibly be trusted by land. What a mess we're in. So with borrowed money, Helen bought this property and then devoted the rest of her life to planning and establishing the Frederick Douglass Memorial and Historical Foundation. So that's what she did to secure his legacy. When he died, uh, his body was buried at Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester, where he had lived for so very long. He died February 20th, 1895 in Washington, D.C. and was transferred to upstate New York. So I wanted to tell you that story because these components of his life were what preceded his being asked to give a speech about the 4th of July. He's someone who met with presidents and foreign dignitaries, He's the most famous black man in America. Now in the 1850s, Slavery didn't end until 1863, and in Texas in 1865, that's Juneteenth, the 1865 part. The discussion of the abolition of slavery was radical, extreme, dangerous. In the speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, Frederick Douglass sought to convince people of the wrongfulness of slavery, but also to make abolition of slavery more acceptable to Northern whites. The Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society invited him to deliver the speech on July 5th, 1852, July 5th is my birthday. The year's wrong here. <laughs> I was not born in 1852. He spoke at Corinthian Hall in Rochester, New York. Now the cost for entry to the speech, interestingly, was 12 and a half cents, which is about $38 today. That's expensive even now. So the speech was reported and reprinted in Northern newspapers and was published and sold as a 40 page pamphlet within weeks of its delivery. So I have provided another video in which I give a very abbreviated version of the speech because a 40 page speech is a very long speech. The language that we use today is much less complex than the language that was used then for writing and speaking. I speak in a rather complicated manner for today's folk, but you will have to listen carefully for the beauty of this language and the weight placed in each and every word. There was no such thing as taking a vacay or having a convo. One had a conversation with one's peers and others. One took a vacation or a holiday. You had meetings. You didn't meet cute. Language has changed. It's a very important speech. It's provided to you and also there is a PowerPoint that has some quotes from Douglas, pictures of his wives, 
lesson plans, information about the people who owned him when he was enslaved, owned him, one cannot own a human being. They had this remarkable human being in chains and fetters, but his mind, because he learned to read and educated himself, was free. There you go. Thank you for joining me in Limbo Land and for being my special Patreon partners. Your subscriptions help me create the art that makes my soul sing and I hope makes your world a bit better too. Until the next time we're together, be certain to live your best story. And I will see you here soon in Limbo Land.